All right, hi. Uh, well, my name is um, Rostislav. Uh, I go by the alias Adam Nuker. I work for Mozilla on video compression, and I am an FFmpeg developer. Uh, what I'll be talking about today is, uh, is something which is kind of unusual for me, because I usually go for technical talks. Uh, I confuse everyone in the audience. Uh, they hate me, and uh, no one wants me to come back. Uh, what I'll be talking about this time is, um, is more of a history on what has happened with, with codecs which have tried to, to, to push the boundaries of what is possible with, uh, with, with video compression and, uh, and how a video codec is, is developed and how old codecs might, might uh, also uh, be of some use. So, um, the, the title of this talk, or the whole talk, might have been a bit influenced by a post which was recently posted by the, uh, by the MPEG um, uh, head of, um, well, the chairman of, FM, uh, of MPEG, and uh, he said how uh, the development model of AV1 is, is killing innovation and it's killing um, uh, research done on video codecs. Uh, and I'm and I'm just here to, to to tell well that is completely wrong and uh, and uh, I'll start by by doing the exact opposite of proving that he's wrong by saying um, well how did we get to this point and uh, what codecs did not help us to get to this point so so we're at this point now uh, where we have uh, the, a standard set of coding tools which are used by pretty much all video compression codecs. Um, everywhere and um, uh, so you have a motion vector search you get a Q index for the frame which is part of the rate control system so it's not really needed to, to get this right uh, you do an audio search for, uh, for each block this is the scalar quantization loop filter some entropy coding and most of these tools were present in uh, well all of them are actually present in MPEG uh, codex since uh, since the 90s so, so you can you might say, well, MPEG has has um, completely changed and revolutionized um, video coding, and yeah, that's that's partly true. They they shown us a way that we can do things uh, which is guaranteed to pretty much work. So, if you impl implement this, you can just budge a new codec, and uh, it will work just as well as any other uh, MPEG codec. But but I'm here to talk about uh, the the, uh, the 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 codecs which came from the left field, so to speak. One of these codecs uh, was Dirac. Uh, Dirac was a, uh, an attempt uh, at making a next generation codec by the BBC. Uh, they were planning to use this in their broadcast networks. They were planning to have hardware support. They had vendors lined up. Uh, they had all sorts of advanced coding techniques, but it was all let down by, by the very thing it tried to implement, which was Wavelets. See, wavelets uh, came more or less from, uh, from around the 90s, and people were convinced that they were the future of uh, video encoding. What they didn't realize was that wavelets were impractical in the way that they, uh, that wavelets were not very practical for video encoding um, instead of image coding. They worked very well for image coding, but they didn't work well for video coding, where you have, uh, where you <laughs> constantly have to, to uh, to, to copy parts of an image to another part of an image uh, and Weblets didn't really um, perfect that. Uh, another codec which tried to revolutionize uh, image coding this time was JPEG 2000. Uh, it's newer than JPEG, so you would expect this to be far better than JPEG, but it isn't. Um, it uses all kinds of new techniques to, to try to, to compress images better, but it doesn't do a much better do job than JPEG, and it's such a shame that nowadays it's being used in the cinema industry, and, uh, and VLC are complaining that they cannot decode TCPs fast enough. Uh, and another codec which also tried to revolutionize uh, video encoding was SVQ3. The, the reason why they failed was uh, their business model. They didn't publish anything and people had to reverse engineer uh, the codec from the tools and if they have to reverse engineer it then well they're probably not going to bother writing an encoder so the codec itself won't develop uh, in the open source scheme and it won't develop in the commercial scheme as well because there's no support for it really. Um, another one was DALA. Uh, which which try to do things completely differently in order to to evade uh, software patents um, and uh, at the end it it caught up to to HCBC 
and uh, was considered to, to, to actually surpass it in terms of, of uh, image and video quality. Uh, unfortunately, it was, uh, it was um, well, prior deprioritized uh, in order to work on AV1, uh, which was kind of a success, actually, because uh, the outcome was that two major coding tools were ported to, uh, to AV1, and one was rewritten. Uh, so, um, and finally, you might think that I'm biased and uh, that MPEG itself has uh, had no negative uh, codecs and were always perfect in everything they did. Well, that's not always true because with MPEG-4 they completely messed up. It was a, an insanely complicated and massive codec uh, which, which required people to actually write a good software implementation which in order to, to actually popularize it and that, that is part of the reason why it became popular because of uh, encoders like XVID and DivX. Uh, but it brought something to the table as well, global motion. So, so all of these, uh, these codecs uh, um, didn't realize uh, they didn't have potential or they didn't have the wrong business model or were deprioritized and so on. Uh, but what does it take to, to develop a new codec? Well, you need to balance... Um, uh, did I miss a slide? No, I didn't. You need to balance all of these three things. Uh, so you need to satisfy hardware complexity, you need to satisfy software complexity, and you need to satisfy um, uh, compression as well. And finally, you also need to satisfy, uh, well, the, the actual licensing uh, as well as any uh, patents as well. Uh, and if you don't do that, then, then you suffer the fate of, of the previous codecs which I talked about. Um, so, Well, the two are inherently incompatible. So what is easy in software is kind of difficult in hardware, usually, and what is easy in hardware, so stuff like uh, conditions and branches are, are well, a pain to work for in software because uh, hardware has no predictors and, and, um, and uh, missed branches and uh, things like that, which reduce performance quite a lot. And if you reduce performance, you generally increase complexity as well because you have to either uh, uh, try to make it simpler or you just leave it as is and uh, uh, suffer uh, the penalty. Uh, but eventually, uh, the, from, the, from the components which I listed in my first slide, which are, uh, which are the essential parts of writing a, which are the standard way you write a video compression codec uh, nowadays, one of them is, or most of them are going to bottleneck, so you can constantly improve it, you can reduce software complexity, you can reduce hardware complexity, you can increase compression, but at the end, one of these tools is going to, to give up. Uh, it's going to bottleneck you in terms of compression, so uh, you have to replace it. And where exactly do you get ideas uh, from, from, um, from where to replace it from? Well, you pick them up from old codecs. So like I said, uh, Dalla contributed some tools to the uh, to AV1. Uh, MPEG-4 had a little bit of contribution as well. Uh, B-frames didn't make an appearance because uh, they were unneeded because you could do more flexible things with the way that um, uh, VP9 uh, had its invisible frames. Uh, so there was no need for uh, B-frame support. Uh, so, so at the end, you need to know where to, where to change things from. You need research, uh, and since uh, none of them um, want to to uh, to uh, to have compromises on compression or on any other coding tools, then um, then really uh, you need to pick ideas either from research papers or from old codecs. So, if you want to see what's going to be in AV2 or AV. One plus nine thousand or something. You need to look into what older codecs did and what research has been going on. Because whilst the codecs themselves didn't make it in terms of of, uh, of popularity, they they did leave uh, research behind, which uh, which might still be developed. You never know. Uh, wavelets are still being researched uh, into, um, and they have found a bit of application in, uh, in terms of error resilience because wavelets are very resilient to errors. 
Uh, AV1 does not include wavelets, but uh, who knows, maybe AV2 will. Um, so, so I finish uh, a bit early, and you might uh, think that it's uh, that I should just end it, but I don't because uh, I have a small anchor. See, I've been working on uh, Vulkan recently. Uh, Vulkan, if you don't know, is a new API for accessing the GPU, uh, and um, and what it allows you to do is uh, completely completely control the GPU in order to have perfect uh, in order to, to know what it will do predictably and in order to have consistent performance on, on all vendors and drivers. Uh, so, so the reason why Vulkan has never been used, uh, the reason why well uh, G uh, other APIs like Direct3D and, uh, and uh, OpenGL have never been used in video encoding was uh, that they were quite a lot limited in what they allowed you to do and they were extended infinite number of times like with OpenGL's uh, frame buffers which kind of allowed you to render off screen uh, but Vulkan completely redoes the way that uh, that, um, that you access the GPU and it allows you to do in theory things which were impossible to do with uh, with, um, with conventional APIs so one of the uh, issues with using Vulkan or GPO to do uh, video encoding is getting the data there to the, in the first place. So with, Vulk so with OpenGL, you had to create a, a, uh, a texture and then you had to upload it in some way and all of this was CPU bound. Uh, so, so even though you could have a hybrid kind of a encoder, you still had to have a dedicated thread to, to, to upload images to the GPU and uh, download uh, information back. And uh, having another thread, well, it usually scares people uh, who work with OpenGL because OpenGL has a global portrait state, uh, which is hard to work around with. Thankfully, Vulkan gives you many, many ways in which you could uh, upload data to the GPU in the first place. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the ways is the traditional uh, way of doing it. So you have a linear image which is lying around on your uh, host RAM. Uh, what you could do is you could, um, you could create a Vulkan linear image. Uh, you could map the memory which packs that image and then you could memory copy uh, your image there. You don't need any global thread um, states, you don't need to mess around with anything. You just map it, upload it, it's there. It still uses the CPU, however, so, so you still need a separate thread. Uh, another way is, is the traditional way of doing it, uh, because using a linear image, uh, which is to say that the data is laid out as it is on your whole drum, and uh, GPUs hate that because of thread, uh, uh, because of uh, cache coherence. Uh, is you could have a uh, a device local optimally tiled image. You create a host visible linear buffer. You map it. You upload it, uh, and then you use the command queues to actually copy. Copies. What you could do instead is, what Vulkan allows you to do finally using an extension, but still, is you could create a host visible um, image, like exactly like one, but instead of using this image to do your uh, calculations on, you could instead, uh, you can instead copy it via an asynchronous queue to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the to another image which is optimally tiled, and the best part is you can actually import uh, file descriptors or uh, or GPU or CPU host memory, and then the driver or um, depending on how well it's implemented can do the copying for you. So you don't have to have a separate thread in order to copy things uh, to the GPU. You could just uh, send it right away, it will, it will create uh, a temporary image, but uh, in theory this will be much, much faster than anything has allowed. So granted, this, this uh, Vulkan allows us to solve one issue. Another issue that comes with using the GPU to, to do encoding is that it's, it's not very practical in terms of what it offers. So video encoding is usually very sequential. You have uh, 
have a bunch of coefficients, you need to quantize them, you need to encode them, and uh, you have a very large amount of predictions. So each coefficient depends on the previous one, and each bit inside the bit stream depends on the previous one. So, so things like, uh, so things like um, uh, doing entropy coding on the GPU is simply impractical and unfeasible with, with, with any API or with any GPU. Uh, but what you could do instead is you could have a uh, a, a an algorithm which uh, which does uh, things like searching for block sizes and psycho psychovisual weights on each uh, on each bit of the image. Uh, so so you could export that to to the GPU, and since you do the uploads for free. You, if you have a look ahead, which is sufficiently large, so a few frames, then there's no problem of actually just exporting this, this whole process to the GPU. So you could have CPU which, which will um, instead do things like search more uh, block sizes and motion vectors and quantization um, uh, indices for each block. Uh, so, what you could also do is you could search uh, for motion vectors. Uh, this will also save you a large amount of time if you were to do this on the GPU as well. Uh, there's quite a lot of research uh, that went into uh, using uh, the GPU for motion vector search. There's quite a lot of uh, algorithms, uh, there's a lot of research papers, but unfortunately there's very little actual code, and most of the research involves uh, Kudo, which is, uh, well, the standard way you use the GPU for anything right now. And it's vendor locked, and it's horrible, and you need uh, proprietary drivers to actually use it. So, so it's a no-go for most people, but thankfully Vulkan allows you to, to have a generic path for all GPUs and for all uh, real operating systems. Not this one, not, not, not on the Mac because it's not available on Mac. It's only available on, uh, on uh, Linux and, um, and anything which will implement it. Mac doesn't because they want to have their own metal thing, which is, uh, which if you have looked at it, it's exactly like Vulkan in absolutely every way. They even call things the same way as Vulkan does. So you could potentially just uh, do a string substitution and end up with something working in metal, but that allows you to, but that would mean actually having to template every single bit of code you, you make. So it's unclear why uh, they haven't allowed it, but thankfully there is an open source alternative which allows you to, to interrupt uh, metal, um, metal with a Vulkan API. So this solves the second issue. You could still use the GPU for something for video encoding. Now, there's a third issue when using the GPU to encode, uh, and, it's, and it has to do with memory management. You see, allocating memory on the GPU is kind of expensive because you have to go to the driver and then, then the driver has to do all the management, has to find memory, has to, has to set it to be yours, and let's not forget that GPUs are quite a lot uh, like, uh, like just CPUs with quite a lot of threads. So uh, it still has a memory management unit which maps physical addresses to virtual addresses and back and forth. Uh, so uh, one of the things you could do with Vulkan is it allows you to lazily allocate memory on the GPU, which, uh, which is to say that you don't have to keep, you don't have to allocate all of your memory at startup. Instead, you could let the GPU uh, handle uh, things like temporary buffers or temporary images for, uh, for in-between pipeline um, image transfer or information transfer uh, where you don't waste memory unless it's actually needed. So lazy images allow you to also um, completely eliminate the need to do any kind of image copying or buffer copying as well because uh, the GPU or the driver itself is usually smart enough to, to know when it's safe to uh, when it's safe to, to just reuse that bit of memory without actually having to copy it. So potentially lazy allocated memory could, could save you uh, memory and uh, time actually doing a GPU to GPU uh, mem copy if the compiler is smart enough and if you manage your buffers well enough. Uh, another issue is that uh, if, you, if you don't reuse images, so uh, for instance, if your decoder running, encoder can support any number of, of, uh, of pixel format changes or width changes or height changes, then 
uh, you may end up in a situation where you constantly destroy your uh, your buffer pool and then you reallocate it with with this uh, new pixel format. Uh, but thankfully, uh, using Vulkan uh, and its new uh, multiplane extension, you could allocate many multiplane images at once, uh, and the driver should internally pull with uh, resources and uh, and decide which one needs allocation by uh, by by checking which one uh, of the previous images it can reuse. Uh, and finally, uh, the final issue with using the GPU to do encoding is that you need to get the data back in somehow. And uh, thankfully, Vulkan, like everything it does, allows you to do uh, many ways to, to actually uh, get information back. So you could put it in a host visible buffer, map it, uh, you could even export memory via a file descriptor and then seek into it and read it like a standard file descriptor and the driver will do the copying or uh, any management for you if, uh, if, uh, if it has to. Um, or it could just do it in, in place. So uh, this is my work in, uh, work in progress uh, tree. Um, right now it doesn't use the CPU less uh, uploading, but it's all work in progress. It does do arbitrary filtering, and it does do, uh, and it it is able to import the RM frames. It cannot do anything useful with them because uh, of an underside with uh, with uh, with the spec. But it's all there. You can uh, test it, and hopefully it will get merged in uh, in the FMPM tree soon. So you could give it a test. Uh, you could run arbitrary shaders and so on. So any questions? Sorry? Do you have the ACK from the DRM? Uh, the ACK? Uh, the the ACK? The DRM. Uh, the hack? Oh, the, the, did I have to hack anything? Uh, no, actually, there's, a, uh, there's an external handle you can use to import memory in Vulkan, and this happens uh, with a new extension which was just posted, and it does work. However, uh, the image you get is, is, uh, is tiled. So if you try to read it like a tiled image and copy it to another image, it will end up scrambled because, uh, because the driver doesn't yet support uh, detailing using uh, DRM images as a source. But I've contacted uh, Meza developers and they're planning to put a new extension up which will allow you to do that. There is also a, another extension on the development which will allow you to, to also use the same path for DRM importing uh, to do importing of, of uh, OpenCL as far as I know and of, uh, VA API uh, images. Um, so you could, you could potentially uh, do processing right on um, VA API decoded images without any overhead uh, to, the G to the CPU. Great team. Another question, I think somewhere there. No? Well, it makes sense because I went quite a lot of off topic uh, because uh, I found out at a later stage that uh, my original topic was a bit uh, too small to actually fit in 25 minutes. But thankfully this is better. Much better. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Hmm? Okay, last chance for a question. Yeah. Since uh, FFmpeg involves much more than MPEG, do you think of renaming the project at some point? <laughs> <laughs> no, thankfully, because look, it's now going to be cool once MPEG goes down. So it's going to be cool in a retro sort of way. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry? Memory off. Memory off? It's going to be called that memory off. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and the last question, perhaps? Yes. Uh, you mentioned CUDA, but proposed using Vulkan instead. Yep. Uh, but as I understand it, uh, OpenCL is the open equivalent to CUDA, isn't it? So why are you using Vulkan instead of OpenCL? Well, because Vulkan is newer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
No, uh, actually, because Vulkan allows you to do all things which you aren't allowed to do with, with OpenCL. Granted, OpenCL is more comfortable to work with uh, than, than uh, Vulkan's pervy uh, format, which, which means um, you need a separate compiler in order to, to actually compile uh, Vulkan uh, kernels into Spurvy and then upload that somehow to the, um, using the API to the uh, GPU. Uh, but Vulkan does allow you to do more things with the GPU than, than, uh, than OpenCL. And it's newer, which is better. Okay, thank you, Atom Nuker. All right, thanks.